Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Let's have a look at new regulations that were put out June 26, 2021. They're titled Regulations Amending Certain Regulations Made Under the Firearms Act. Now, in an ideal world, I'd say that you should first watch my video on Bill C-71. Unfortunately, I don't have a video on Bill C-71 yet. It came out before I started recording these videos. However, they're proposing that C-71 will come into effect, and so I'm going to have to make a video to explain what all that's going to mean. However, that's going to take a little bit, and candidly, that's because it is hotter than Satan's sauna in here, and so recording videos under a ring light is a bit of a chore, and that's going to be one that is fairly lengthy. However, I'm going to try my best to explain what these regulations do. Let me know in the comments below if things are clear. If anything is unclear, I'll try to make sure to include that and to go over it again in the, uh, the follow-up video on C-71. So this one starts out with a regulatory impact analysis statement, and I'm going to skip over that for now. I am going to link to this page in the description below. You may want to check this out and read it. It provides the government's explanation of what they're going to be doing. However, let's instead dive all the way down here to the legislation. And there's a bunch of things that this does. One of the first things is that it trims out some of the old language that referred to possession-only licenses. And this makes sense. I mean, this helps make the law a little clearer. This is a good thing because possession-only licenses are no longer available. All of the possession-only licenses, I, I think all of them have been rolled over into possession and acquisition licenses. However, now we get to this part and it says, the regulations are amended by adding the following after section 24. Conditions. The following information is prescribed for the purposes of paragraph 58.1 sub 1 sub a of the act. Now the act that it's referring to here is the Firearms Act. And if you look at the Firearms Act, you will not see this paragraph in there yet. That's because C71 is going to add this. Let's have a look at what that's going to do. So that says that the act is amended by adding the following after section 58, which is the condition sections. And it says conditions, license issued to business. The chief firearms officer who issues a license to a business must attach the following conditions to the license. A, the business must record and for the prescribed period, keep the prescribed information that relates to the business's possession and disposal of non-restricted firearms. And the prescribed period here is gonna be 20 years. B, the business must record and for a period of 20 years from the day on which the business transfers a non-restricted firearm or for a period longer that may be prescribed, keep the following information in respect of the transfer. One, the reference number issued by the registrar. Two, the day on which the reference number was issued. Three, the transferee's license number. And four, the firearms make, model, and uh, type. And if any, its serial number. And C, the business must, unless uh, directed otherwise by a chief firearms officer, transmit any records containing the re information referred to in paragraph A or B to a prescribed official if it is determined that the business will cease to be a business. Let's swing back and have a look at what this is going to add to that. So this notes, the following information is prescribed for the purpose of paragraph 58.1 sub A of the Act. So this is additional information that a firearm business will have to collect. A, the classification of the firearm, so whether it's prohibited, restricted, non-restricted, etc. B, the date and an indication of any business activity related to the possession or the disposal of the firearm, including, if applicable, its purchase, sale, bartering, gifting, consignment, importation, exportation, repair, alteration, deactivation, destruction, manufacture, pawn broking, storage, and display. C, the firearms manufacturer make, model, type, action, gauge, or caliber, barrel length, and in the case of a fixed magazine, magazine capacity. D, all serial numbers on the firearms frame or receiver. E, the name and address of the individual or business to which the firearm was sent or from which the firearm was received in the course of any business activity referred to in paragraph B, other than an activity that relates to a transfer of the firearm, if applicable. And the reason why they exclude transfer is that that gets recorded elsewhere. And F, if the business caused the firearm to be shipped by another person, the name of the shipper or carrier, their license number or permit number, if applicable, and the package tracking number of the shipped firearm. They set the period at 20 years, and they note that if a business goes out of business, that they have to provide all of their records to the registrar. Now, let's jump here to a quote from Mr. Trudeau. Uh, we will not be bringing back a long gun registry. Uh, that is uh, not part of our plan and has never been. All right, so he says that they're not bringing back the long gun registry. This is a long gun registry. That's what's going on here. And so basically, anytime a firearm-related business 
touches a gun, whenever they come into possession, they're going to have to create a record and store all of this information, which includes the name and address of the person who they got it from and where it's going. Now, when I say when they come into possession, that's not just, you know, the business is selling the gun or anything else. This includes repair. So if you take your gun to a gunsmith, that gunsmith is going to have to put this in their records or the alteration. So if you take this to, you know, have a scope added, if you take this to have it, anything done to it, they're going to end up creating this record. So this is essentially a long gun registry. They're just proposing to do it a little differently this time. So yeah, when he made that promise, I kind of suspect he knew that this was the plan all along, that this was just, well, we still want a long gun registry. We just kind of want to do it a little differently. And we want to call it something other than the long gun registry because people hate the registry. It costs a tremendous amount of money. It solves no crimes. And yeah, so a lot of this now will push those costs of the registry onto firearm businesses. However, this will increase costs when the government actually wants to do a query of the registry, when they want to check out information. So all of this is effectively a campaign promise broken, and it's really concerning because it's going to result in people being sort of less willing to take their guns to a gunsmith. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of when they say, hey, we're not going to bring in the registry, and that's exactly what they're doing. Now, the next thing I'm going to go over is this bit. They're amending the conditions of transferring firearms and other weapons uh, regulations. And so people are going, what does all of this mean? So information relating to transferees license. The prescribed information for the purpose of subsection 23 sub 2 of the act is all of the information set out on the front of the transferee's license, including the photograph. You might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, this is in conjunction with their new idea for how you would transfer a, a non-restricted firearm. Right now, if I want to sell a friend a non-restricted firearm, all I really need to do is go up and, you know, check their license. I can read their license and go, okay, that's, that's fine. Or, you know, this might be somebody I know. It might be somebody who I know is operating a firearm business. And so there's not a whole lot of point in me asking them, oh, can I check your license right now? Because I might be literally standing in their gun store and knowing that the fact that the police haven't shut down the gun store means their license is still good. However, they want to create a system whereby you have to phone in every time you want to transfer a non-restricted firearm. And that's found, and this is again in Bill C-71, in paragraph 23 sub 1. A person may transfer one or more non-restricted firearms if at the time of the transfer, A, the transferee holds a license authorizing the transferee, so the person getting the gun, to acquire and possess a non-restricted firearm. B, the registrar has at the transferor's request issued a reference number for the transfer and provided it to the transferor. So this is the person sending it has to get the reference number and see the reference number is still valid. And then subsection two, which is what this is amending or what this is affecting, uh, the transferee shall provide to the transferor the prescribed information that relates to the transferee's license for the purpose of enabling the transferor to request that the registrar issue a reference number for the transfer. So, all of that is written in super complicated and super unclear and confusing language, and it's not really clear why they did that. However, the basic idea here is that when I... So let's say I want to buy a non-restricted firearm from a friend of mine. I'm going to have to provide him with all of the information on the front of my license, including the photograph. Now, all of that information includes things like my height, my date of birth, my eye color, um, all sorts of things that aren't really going to be changing. I'm not, my eyes aren't changing color anytime soon. I'm not getting any taller or any shorter. So there's going to be a problem here. Let's uh, jump back a little further. And we see that for the purposes of the issuance of a reference number under section 23 of the act, the transferor must, when making a request to the registrar under paragraph 23 1B of the act, Confirm that they have taken reasonable steps to verify that the transferee is the holder of the license, including, in the case of a transfer that is completed in person, whether in whole or in part, by comparing the photograph on the license with the person presenting themselves as the transferee, and in all other cases, by using the method set out in paragraph A, 
or if the comparison cannot be undertaken using that method by comparing the information on the transferee's license with another piece of photo identification that has been issued by the government of Canada, the government of a province, or a municipality. Now, I'm going to say this is a very stupid way of doing this. The reason why I, I say that is that basically I have to give all of this information to the person who I'm thinking of buying a gun from. So let's say I'm online, I'm on an online forum, somebody tells me, hey, I'm selling a shotgun, it's going for this price, and I think that's a great price. So I'm going to get in touch with this guy, and now we have to get a reference number. I can't apply for the reference number. He, as the seller, has to get that reference number, which means I have to give him, you know, the everything that's on the front of my license. And probably, because we're doing this online, I've got to send him a second piece of photo identification. Well, let's say this guy's not selling a shotgun. Let's say this guy is actually a criminal. And so now I'm sending him two pieces of photo ID. What can you do with two pieces of photo ID? Well, you can probably take out a mortgage. Or these are two pieces of photo ID that then help you solve this problem to get a, a reference number. He can then turn around and go to another seller and say, I want to buy a non-restricted firearm from you and look at this information that I have. Of course, it's my information, not his, but because I've given up everything that is basically used as a security check, it's now out there in the world and can be misused. There is absolutely going to be criminal misuse of this. This is a really bad way of setting this up. And I think that they did this in order to make this difficult and onerous. Because let's say I'm going to a gun show. I don't know who I'm going to buy a gun from if I go to a gun show. But I'm probably going to buy a gun because I often do when I'm at a gun show. So I'm going to have to go there and I'm going to have to provide this information to anyone I'm thinking of buying a gun from. I can't do that in advance. I don't know who all is going to be there. And I'm not going to contact every vendor and ask them to get a, a license or a reference number. What would make more sense is if I could call ahead to the Canadian Firearms Program and get a reference number that applies to me. But they want to make sure that they've got the transferor and the transferee there because, again, this is sort of a backwards attempt to create a really terrible and unclear registry. So, that is a bit of a problem. I mean, the ideal system that I, you know, if we think that this is a good idea, a much more ideal system would be something where I call up the Canadian Firearms Program, I give them this information about me, and thus it remains between me and the Canadian Firearms Program, not this third party who may or may not be trustworthy. And they say, okay, here's a reference number. And then that reference number could be paired with my license number with perhaps an online system where you can just go in, plug in the license number, plug in the reference number. And if those two pairs of data match, it'll spit out and say, yes, this is a valid reference number. Otherwise it would say no. Yeah, this is going to be abused. It's going to be abused by people who want to buy guns unlawfully and who are going to say, hey, you know, look, I've complied with all of the requirements set out by the government, so sell me the gun. It's also going to be abused, I'm sure, by people who want to use this for identity theft. So this is a terrible bit of legislation. It is absolutely awful. Uh, they're doing a consultation period right now, so I recommend that you get in touch with your member of parliament and also email. I'll try to link the uh, where they're doing the consultation, but let them know how bad this is. All right, so there's another little bit here that I want to cover before I wrap this up, and that is part of their uh, the regulatory impact analysis statement. Now, here it notes this statement is not part of the regulations. And it isn't. This is just an explainer. It might end up being used in court if there's some sort of challenge, but this is just providing some uh, some details. Now, the bit I want to talk about here is this paragraph right here. It says, by creating a requirement for a vendor, whether an individual or a business, to verify the license of a buyer with the registrar and for the registrar to confirm that the license is valid, individuals presenting stolen or fraudulent licenses or those for whom license eligibility is in question, i.e. due to an ongoing investigation by a chief firearms officer, would no longer be able to acquire non-restricted firearms. Now, this part here, the those for whom license eligibility is in question, 
this is basically creating a backdoor system because right now if the chief firearms officer is investigating your license your license is still valid until they have enough information that they go ahead and revoke your license but they're creating this new system whereby normally to prevent you from buying guns with the license they have to actually revoke it and that enables you to engage in challenges of it you can take this to a section 74 hearing they've got to give you proper notice there's all sorts of procedural fairness implications to that when they're doing an investigation they don't give you notice they don't any of that and it's very difficult to challenge that they've decided to do this so now uh, this is actually in some ways worse than the long gun registry because if the registrar denied you a registration certificate, they had to give you notice in writing in the prescribed form, and you could challenge that through Section 74. Now they're just going to refuse to issue you a reference number, which is going to fall into this giant legal gray area, which is going to mean a tremendous amount of litigation. It's going to mean a tremendous amount of court cases. I'm good. These people may start to see the effects of this, and they may say, you know what? Um, I'm not happy with this. You know, why is it that I've got to have these weights and these unnecessary processes in order to, to buy a, a rifle to take hunting? You may also see people, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be news stories as soon as people are misusing this in order to illegally buy firearms because this system makes it real easy. Or as soon as people are, you know, are finding that they tried to buy a shotgun and now somebody's taking out a mortgage in their name. Anyway, um, there's once you've given all of the information that you're going to have to give to a seller, there's actually very few details left that the Canadian Firearms Program can use to verify that you are you. And most of those details could be dug up without too much trouble from somebody who just does a little bit of research. So this is creating some tremendous insecurity in the system. It makes it very easy for somebody to pretend to be you. There's going to be a whole lot of identity theft issues. Um, frankly, a lot of this information might even be stuff that people could use to uh, essentially engage in password recovery attacks in order to get into your email. I got real big problems with what they're doing here. Anyway, I guess I'll cut it off here. If there's anything that I've left unclear, please let me know in the comments below. As I said, I'm going to do a video going through all of Bill C-71. That'll be coming out when I can get it done. But if you let me know that something is unclear here, something you want more explanation on, I can make sure to revisit that and to explain it in a little more detail. I also want to let you know, as mentioned before, I'm going to have links to some of the stuff I've talked about in the description below. There's also going to be a link to my Patreon. Uh, if you want to support me, that's one way to do it. Uh, please also like this video. Please share it with your friends. Subscribe if you want to see more content. I want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, Jason Elliott, D. Mo, Canada's National Firearms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Ivo Nedev, Christopher Molina, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Marc Olivier Demour. And at the $20 level, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich and Adam Meester. Thank you as well to everyone at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Um, I guess one question that I have been asked that I don't think I've answered yet is there's a lot of people saying, you know what, I've been thinking of buying a non-restricted firearm. Um, should I rush ahead and buy it before this kicks in? And really, if you wait until they've put in these regulations, you're going to have a lot of additional steps, a lot of additional red tape. So now is a great time to buy a non-restricted firearm. Uh, go to your gun store. If there's something you've had your eye on, now's a great time. And the gun stores could probably use the business. So, all right. Thank you for watching. I, I wish I could say this was better news, but I hope I've armed you with knowledge. Till next time.